Welcome to Not Two Reads, an audio library of revolutionary texts. Chile, an attempt at historic compromise. The real story of the Allende years by Jorge Palacios. Chapter 4 The Strategy of Social Imperialism in Chile 3. The Policy of Social Imperialism Toward the Victory of the Popular Unity Salvador Allende's victory in the 1970 election caused deep disarray and concern amongst the Soviet rulers. In the same way, the U.S., which believed that Alessandri would win with 40% of the vote, was not expecting a UP victory. We have already pointed out that the Soviet line, which the CP leaders failed to implement, was for the traditional left, including the CP, to get into government in coalition with the CDP, that is, in an agreement with US imperialism. They did not want, nor were they prepared to assume in other Latin American countries, the risks and the economic bloodletting which the ill-timed turn of the Cuban government toward pro-Soviet Marxism had brought about. Open support on their part for a regime like the UP, which called itself Marxist, and on the road to socialism, which was seen around the world as implementing the theses of the 20th Congress, and which the pro-Soviet communists were participating in, all this right in the U.S. imperialism geopolitical zone, represented an open challenge to U.S. imperialism. Such a challenge could mean that the U.S. would arrogate itself to the right to intervene in any conflict which might arise in Eastern Europe, like the Czechoslovakia conflict, for example, a region of Europe where the USSR had serious potential problems, such as the succession to Tito in Yugoslavia and the leanings towards independence of Romania and other countries. We must remember that the United States government remained neutral toward the invasion of Czechoslovakia, recognizing the right of social imperialism to domination. Similarly, it must be remembered that one of the causes of the fall of Khrushchev was his adventurism in installing missiles in Cuba, an act which pushed the USSR to within an inch of war with the US. It was able to avoid war only by accepting not only the withdrawal of these missiles under threat of an ultimatum, but also the humiliation of allowing the US to inspect the ships affecting the transfer. Because of these considerations and others, the policy of the Soviet rulers towards the Allende government was aloof and extremely cautious, both in their designs for economic penetration and in their financial aid or political support for the government. This aloofness increased as the government went into crisis and began to suffer heavy blows from the offensive destined to overthrow it. This policy of the USSR towards Chile under Allende is confirmed by numerous accounts and concrete facts which further exposes the hypocrisy of the protest campaign organized after the coup d'etat. Already, in regard to the election campaign, Kerry, the U.S. ambassador to Chile, had stated, according to ITT documents brought to light by the U.S. Senate subcommittee, which investigated the involvement of the multinational enterprises in Chile, quote, With respect to Russia, I discount the part the Russians have played in Allende's election, end quote. With respect to the credits granted by the Eastern European countries and the USSR at the beginning of the Allende government, when there was still some hope for it, they were granted under conditions equal to or worse than the credits of US imperialism. That is, they were linked with projects favoring the creditor countries, and often at a rate of interest higher than that normally in effect on the international market. This caused a real scandal within the UP commissions which had to go to these countries to negotiate. In particular, these countries charged higher than normal rates of interest on the short-term loans that were most urgent for the acquisition of things indispensable to the functioning of the economy. They profited from the fact that these loans were extremely urgent for the Chilean government and from the blockade enforced by the international financial organizations dependent on the United States. Both the socialist countries of Comic-Con and countries with reactionary governments like Spain and West Germany, which were tempted by the attractive offers that the Chilean government had to make to break the blockade, participated in the speculation on the expense of very serious difficulties in Chile. However, 
in the very critical moments at the end of 1972, when President Allende himself had to go to the USSR to ask for a credit of $500 million that was absolutely essential to cover the balance of payments deficit, this credit was refused by Brezhnev himself. This fact is attested by Juan E. Garces, one of the closest collaborators of Allende, in his book on Chile after the coup d'etat. He refused, even though Allende was forced to sign a joint communique in which he appeared to subscribe to the formulations of Soviet international policy dealing with regions very distant from the Latin American continent, as, for example, on the European Conference on Security and Economic Cooperation, on the reunification of Germany, on the Middle East, and even on Bangladesh. What is more, Allende was forced to make serious concessions on the firm and traditional Chilean policy of defending the 200 nautical mile territorial sea which both the USSR and the US were fighting, and to make a commitment to, quote, harmonize their positions and mutually collaborate, taking into account the interests of all states, end quote. The $500 million credit was requested not for ambitious development projects, but for the urgent acquisition of food and raw materials, intended to soften the economic catastrophe which was preparing the ground for the military coup. Furthermore, the United States had previously received a formal guarantee that the Soviet government would not grant substantial aid to the Allende government. At the meeting held on October 21, 1971, between the Committee of Multinational Firms Having Interest in Chile and the U.S. Secretary of State to organize an offensive against the U.P. government, William Rogers indicated that he had talked to the Russian Minister of Foreign Affairs to see whether or not Moscow would finance Chile as it had financed Cuba. He added, quote, Russia denies having such a plan, end quote. One can also read the ITT document examined by the U.S. Senate. Allende's collaborator, Juan E. Garces, also cites this document in the book mentioned above. Furthermore, at the precise moment when the U.S. copper companies were committing aggression against Chile, Kozgin announced his plan to exploit Siberian copper in collaboration with these same companies. At the same time, a large portion of the credits obtained from the Eastern European countries was not used, either because they were not asked for in time to figure in the production plans of these countries, or because the anarchy which reigned in the UP economy prevented the sending of studies demanded by the creditor countries prior to the allocation of funds, or because it was thought that these credits were not suitable. On November 28, 1972, the CDP Member of Parliament, Claudio Huepe, basing his case on a publication of the Production and Development Corporation, Corfo, denounced the non-utilization of 95.2% of the credits from the socialist camp. As far as commercial or technical relations with the USSR during the Allende government are concerned, these were so minimal that the right-wing press, extremely careful to denounce any interference in this field, had almost nothing to speculate upon. During the three years of the Allende government, the newspaper El Mucurio, denounced only the activity of a few Russian fishing boats rented by the government, publicizing the protest of the leaders of the Fishermen's Corporation, the visit of a 16-man Soviet delegation to conclude economic arrangements, the signing, at the end of March 1972, of an agreement for the purchase of 5,000 tractors in the USSR, and Chile sending back to the USSR 125 graders, which were unsuited to the Chilean soil and defective. The most serious denunciation seemed to concern the acceptance by the government of Soviet technicians in the national copper enterprises. At the end of June 1973, the Christian Democratic Senator Juan de Dios Carmona protested the hiring of 36 advisors and 10 interpreters by virtue of an agreement with the Svetmet Promexport firm of Moscow for salaries of $844 and $470 a month respectively which far exceeded the legal maximum equal to 20 times the minimum subsistence level. In December 1972, the CDP had already sent a letter to President Allende questioning, quote, access by Soviet technicians to industrial secrets and to the experiments of large national mining enterprises, thus favoring so strong a potential competitor as the USSR, end quote. In the same letter, the CDP also asked, quote, is it true that the Soviet Union, in its position of Big Brother, a position assigned for the first time to a foreign country by a president of the Republic of Chile, grants us, grants us credits with strings attached, 
something you and the parties of the popular unity used to criticize so harshly, end quote. On the subject of arms purchases from the USSR, here was an attempt which, it seems, was rejected by the USSR, or in any case did not materialize, when in May 1973, the commander-in-chief of the armed forces, General Carlos Prats, visited the Soviet Union accompanied by General Bonilla and Benavides. Symptomatically, as Juani Garces points out in his book, quote, The right-wing military men decided on May 25, just when Prats was in Europe and Pinochet was replacing him as commander-in-chief of the army, to organize a coup d'etat, end quote. It is difficult to see the real meaning of this trip, which came at a time that could not have been less opportune, for the Putsch's circles, incited by the CIA and the Pentagon, had been very active for a long time. And one of the most unpardonable things for the U.S. is arms purchases from the USSR. Was it an unsuccessful attempt to threaten the U.S. so that it would stop arousing the Putsch's in the army? If that was the intended goal, the effect was exactly the opposite, as facts soon showed. In any event, it was an unusual initiative, taken in a moment of extreme difficulty. It did not correspond to the usual policy of the Chilean government, which had never attempted to buy arms in the Warsaw Pact countries, and still less did it correspond to the intentions of the USSR and of these countries. In this field, as in any other field which would signal an intention by the USSR to resolutely support the Chilean government, neither the Pentagon nor the White House had any worries, at least in the short term. The intelligence reports they had available indicated with total clarity that neither the USSR nor the Eastern European countries were thinking of supporting the Chilean government, either militarily or economically. The U.S. government, as the report of the U.S. Senate on the activities of the CIA in Chile found, made use of regular studies by the intelligence services, called National Intelligence Estimates, NIEs, which were drawn up not only by the CIA, but also by the State Department's Bureau of Intelligence and Research, INR. These studies were analyzed by a special board of the U.S. government. The NIE sent in 1969 predicted that any new administration established in Chile would explore, the, would explore the establishment of better relations with the communist and socialist countries. In addition, it pointed out that Allende in particular would take this step, but it also stated that he would be prevented from going too far in this direction due to Chilean nationalism, which would energetically oppose any subordination, whether to Moscow or Havana or to Washington. Allende, the report continues, which strengthened Chile's relations with the socialist and communist countries over the years. However, he would be careful not to subordinate Chile's interest to any communist or socialist power, and not to break links with any non-communist countries, to whose aid he would continue to resort. The 1971 and 1972 NIEs stated that Allende was charting an independent and nationalistic course. In short, Allende, the report points out, was committed to a policy of non-alignment. A 1970 NIE predicted that Allende would establish relations with Cuba as soon as he was elected. However, a 1971 NIE described the state of Chilean-Cuban relations as one of ideological distance and closer economic ties. It also pointed out that, despite Allende's long-standing personal relationship with Castro, he had refrained from excessive overtures to him. A 1972 NIE, moreover, recognized that Havana had been circumspect about trying to use Chile as a base for promoting revolution throughout Latin America. In 1970, the reports still show a certain concern about the expansion of Soviet influence in Chile under Allende, and about the establishment of a major Soviet military presence. However, a 1971 NIE predicted that the Soviet Union would not be certain of its ability to make a decisive impact, given Allende's desire for independence, although it continued to exploit its influence in the Chilean government through the Communist Party of Chile. The same NIE states that neither Allende nor the Chilean military would tolerate a permanent Soviet military presence in Chile. Finally, a 1972 NIE centering on the Soviet attitude toward the Allende regime maintained that it was, quote, characterized by caution and restraint, end quote. This attitude, added the report, was, quote, due to Soviet reluctance to antagonize the U.S., end quote, and, more importantly, to a Soviet desire to avoid with Allende, quote, 
the type of open-ended commitment for aid that they had entered into with Castro, end quote. An intelligence note prepared by the State Department stated that a Soviet Chilean communique, issued following Allende's visit to the USSR in December 1972, quote, reflected Moscow's decision to continue a cautious policy towards Chile and to avoid a major open-ended commitment of aid to Allende. According to the intelligence note, the Soviets apparently advised Allende to negotiate his differences with the U.S., end quote. This attitude of the Soviet social imperialist rulers towards the Allende government is fully consistent with their decision to support only a government of collaboration with U.S. imperialism through a UP-CDP alliance in Chile. This also explains why the CP leaders sought in an obsessive manner to ally themselves with the CDP during the Allende government, as a strategic goal and not as a mere tactic. They pursued this goal before Allende's election, during the Allende government, and they are continuing today, after the military coup, to push this same policy. 4. The Pursuit of a UP-CDP Pact During the Allende Government This policy, conducive to a joint exploitation of Chile by social imperialism and U.S. imperialism, offering the latter, in exchange for this co-government, the paralysis of the mass struggle, which the CDP never obtained during its administration, began with the pressure that the CP leaders put on Allende to convince him to sign the constitutional guarantees demanded by the CDP to approve his nomination as president in the Congress. One of the pillars of this policy was to convince Allende that he could count on the army spirit of constitutionalism, democracy, and professionalism. For this purpose, they used, as a smokescreen, the only or almost the only high military leader on whom they had any influence, General Carlos Brat. At the same time, in an effort as desperate as it was fruitless, they tried to broaden their influence in the Army High Command, where the U.S., due to all the links it had established with the military over the decades, had an overwhelming advantage over them. In fact, this second CP failure added to the first, the impossibility of leading the UP into a pact with the CDP, more because of the influence of Frey and his team within the CDP than because of the resistance of some circles in the UP, also conditioned the distant and cautious attitude of the USSR toward the Chilean experience. In any case, the fact that Bratz held the post of Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces was a permanent threat to the numerous putschist trends which were fighting for hegemony within the army. It was feared he might draw part of the army into supporting the government. United with the people's resistance, this faction would have represented a serious obstacle to the Putsch's plans. It was not by chance that Radio Moscow announced after the coup d'etat that Bratz was marching south at the head of troops faithful to the government. Nor was it by chance that the military junta decided to assassinate Bratz in Buenos Aires, where he took refuge following the coup. He worked there in the firm of a powerful industrialist closely linked to the Soviets, José Gelbart, who, being Perón's Minister of the Economy, had a three-hour-long conversation with Brezhnev during a trip to the USSR. Nor was it by chance that the setting up of a hierarchy for the coup d'etat, thenceforth led by Prat's replacement as Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, Augusto Pinochet, was accomplished during Prat's trip to the USSR, and that the coup d'etat materialized after his retirement from the army. Pinochet himself, in statements to Radio Agriculture of Santiago on September 3, 1974, said, quote, It would have been enough that one department, that a single unit, not carry out the orders coming from Santiago for the country to be plunged immediately into a civil war, end quote. This possibility of a people's resistance uniting with a part of the army that would be faithful to the government frightened the CP leading group as much as it frightened Pinochet, if not more. This is why the CP leaders opposed the initiative of the masses in crushing the employer's strike in October 1972, and hastened to impose their solution, a solution full of concessions to the opposition, through a military cabinet. For the same reason, they constantly opposed the plan of Allende, who, despite his confidence in the armed forces, was setting up a whole system of defense based on the people's mass organizations, a system that might have worked in conjunction with the loyal sections of the army against any attempted putsch. Expressing Allende's opinions on this subject, Joan Garces, his closest advisor, maintains, quote, 
the Armed Forces People's Organizations link-up could be conceived of and implemented starting in 1970 on condition that it corresponds to the goals of the anti-Putschist movement in the army, to avoid civil war by defending and strengthening the political and social institutions based on democratic principles that permitted the free expression of the popular will. The need for it could be established because it was legitimized by the legal responsibilities incumbent on the government and by the UP program, as well as by existing legal provisions. It will suffice to refer to the Civil Defense Act of 1945, which provided for coordination between the workers' trade unions and other civil organizations on the one hand, and carabineros and armed forces on the other, to prevent or prepare for exceptional situations and situations of national emergency. Civil defense under the command of the Ministry of the Interior and its regional representatives, that is, under strictly political government leadership, not military, end quote. And Garces adds, quote, The UP counted on its legitimacy as holder of government, and on the will of the temporarily predominant section within the armed forces and the carabineros, to defend democratic institutions against subversion and sabotage. It counted on the organized trade unions throughout the country, and on legal instruments, to put together in time a whole network, as elaborate and vast as they might desire, to prevent actions of sabotage and subversion, which, for three years, were the principal means used by the counter-revolution to disrupt the socio-economic mechanisms of social integration and equilibrium, end quote. And then he adds, quote, The mass counterpart of the policy in regard to the armed forces was the goal of various initiatives by President Allende beginning in January 1971, not only in private, such as his speech to the plenum of the CC of the CP in June of that year, but also in public. On February 29, 1971, in Punta Arenas, where he had gone with three commanders-in-chief to visit the military bases of the region, in a speech in the covered stadium that was broadcast on the radio and partially reproduced in the press, Allende declared that it was necessary to organize the masses of the people in order to give the military dissuasion policy of the UP its own social base, end quote. And Garces then points out, quote, If the rank and file and the supporters of the workers' parties had counted on new forms of action, which was most difficult, if the circumstances made it necessary to distribute arms, this would have been done, for it was implicitly provided for in the government's plans, as President Allende publicly showed on June 29, 1973. But this required prior preparation of the citizens for new forms of fighting, distinct from the merely electoral forms, end quote. Garces concludes, quote, Such were, in summary, the central theses which shaped the speech of President Allende on February 29, 1971, end quote. And he adds, quote, Even on June 5, 1973, amongst Allende's recommendations to the political committee of the UP, one can read, 1. Mass Front, People's Organization to Resist the Confrontation Three Four Months Forward, end quote. And we add a final commentary by the political advisor of Allende's who was not exactly known for his sympathy towards the supporters of people's armed struggle for power, but who, on the contrary, tried throughout his work to show that this road was not applicable to Chile. Quote, and in these circumstances, end quote, he adds, quote, what a cruel contrast. During the whole of 1971 and 1972, the entire left-wing press denounced the fact that the right was organizing in parliamentary fashion, that its urban residential zones were prepared for centrally led and coordinated civil actions, that there were alert exercises and psychological adaptation exercises, etc. And for more than two years, the left knew about and publicly described, in full detail and with ample information, the civil organizations which were preparing the bourgeois insurrection. But the workers' districts, the factories, the headquarters of the workers' parties organized nothing similar in defense of democratic freedoms of the legally constituted government, and lastly, of its own raison d'être, the interests of the working class, end quote. It must be said, furthermore, that although President Allende went in person to the plenum of the CC of the CP to put this problem to them, the CP leaders categorically rejected this defense organization of the masses. For this reason, they were criticized even by the Soviet rulers, Judas-like hypocrites who want to wash their hands so that no one pins their responsibility on them. The CP leaders rejected Allende's plan because they were less honest than Allende, because it did not conform with their plans for state capitalism 
and because they were more lucid than Allende's close advisor, Garcés. They knew, however, that the armed forces were essentially in the service of Yankee imperialism, despite their constant praise for their professionalism and their constitutionalism, and that there were only two solutions. Either destroy the armed forces, which they in no way wanted to do, or neutralize them, by reaching an agreement with imperialism through the CDP, which, moreover, was the demand of the Soviet mentors. Consequently, the CP leaders were also not aware that as much as they might be defensive in the beginning, the mass organizations proposed by President Allende would inevitably escape their control, becoming an antagonistic fighting force against the opposition bloc, to the extent that the latter pushed forward its subversive actions, and in the end, against the armed forces, to the extent that the latter showed evidence of putschist intentions. Thus, such mass organizations, under the possible influence of revolutionary ideas and of the existing high level of fighting spirit, threatened to become instruments of a policy opposed to the CP leaders' intentions to conciliate with and to preserve the system, so as to build their farce of socialism on this basis. This is why the CP leaders categorically opposed not only organizations of this type which, as Garces himself points out, would eventually have been provided with arms, but also the innocent electoralist-type popular unity committees, which they managed to dissolve after having used them for the last time in the elections of April 1971. Garces, as well as analysts further to the left in Allende's government, seemingly did not understand that the CP leaders and the International Reactionary Center which directed them were much farther to the right than he and President Allende. There's a big difference between sincerely aspiring to socialism while applying erroneous methods to obtain it, and pretending to want socialism in order to establish an oppressive state capitalism, as the CP leaders intend to do. This blind obedience to the Soviet watchword of alliance with the CDP made them oppose not only the formation of mass defense organizations, but also President Allende's much more innocent idea of calling a special referendum, which would bring out popular support for the basic points of the UP program. A referendum of this type would mean that the UP, by relying directly on the support of the masses of the people, would free itself from the CDP's work to obstruct any government initiative, obstruction which grew out of the CDP's growing tendency to adopt the firm style of opposition practiced by the right. But the tactic of the CP leaders was precisely to profit from the growing number of obstacles which the government was meeting in its path in order to put pressure on it and to convince their reticent UP allies of the necessity of reaching an agreement with the CDP at all costs. A successful referendum held the danger of reproducing, in an even riskier form, the strategy which the Soviets judged unacceptable for Chile, and for Italy and France today. The implementation of reforms on the basis of a left bloc that would confront an opposition including the populist sections manipulated by US imperialism. Or, in other words, they were opposed to an attitude of openly challenging the U.S. in its sphere of influence, instead of collaborating with it partly through willingness and partly through force, which was the goal of the Soviets. Unfortunately, the CP leaders succeeded in drawing the leaders of the other UP parties into opposing the referendum initiative, even though the other leaders gave different arguments for rejecting it, and so did the CP leaders as a tactic. Garces makes the following comments on this question, quote, Each initiative by Allende to reach legislative agreement with the CDP was only the solution he was driven to after the rejection by the UP political committee of what he considered the most correct course to solve the problem, to ask the country to take a definite stand, through a referendum, on the means necessary for the government to continue to implement the UP common program, end quote and he goes on to give examples which show just how clever this tactic of the communist leaders was. Quote, The Agenda Tomic talks of December 1971 followed the rejection by the UP of the referendum proposals made by the President of the Republic in June, July, and August of the same year. The negotiations with the President of the CP, R. Fuente Alba, in May 1972 followed the rejection of the referendum proposal made to the UP by Allende after the defeat in the Colchagua and O'Higgins by-elections in January of the same year. 
the talks with the CDP in July to August 1973 were requested by President Allende after all the parties in the government coalition had refused, in June, to settle the main conflict with Parliament, the nationalization of enterprises, through a general consultation, end quote. And he adds, quote, In proportion as the revolutionary process advanced without the UP having a clear majority in Parliament, the CDP's role as arbitrator grew under conditions more and more unfavorable to the working-class parties, end quote. But this was exactly what Corbalan and his cronies wanted. Quote, the Communist Party in particular, end quote, Garces states, quote, thought that it, the referendum, was bound to fail. Its general secretary, Luis Corbalan, argued this way, and summed it up in a very popular phrase, quote, we'll lose from here to Penco, end quote, end quote. Here we see nothing less than the party which has placed its confidence in elections in order to empower, opposing an electoral consultation on the subject of the UP program, and totally subordinating this program to a high-level deal with the CDP. This was in January 1972. But even before, when the UP had just obtained more than 50% of the vote in the April 1971 elections, in July 1971, another possibility for electoral consultation came up on a measure as important and as much in demand by public opinion as the nationalization of copper. All the members of Parliament, from the extreme right to the UP, including the CDP, were forced to vote for the constitutional reform that made possible the nationalization of the big copper mining industry. However, some articles of the initial government bill were deleted by the parliamentary majority, and the president vetoed this deletion and proposed that the UP, instead of promulgating the prune-down bill parliament had passed, call referendum in support of the original bill. But the parties in the UP opposed this. Quote, the Communist Party, end quote, says Garces, quote, declared itself absolutely opposed to referring the promulgation of the Mines Nationalization Bill, flatly rejecting the call of a referendum, end quote. Especially at that time, after the UP had obtained more than 50% of the vote a few months before, there was no doubt that the referendum would have been won, particularly since it concerned a reform so much desired by the people as the nationalization of copper. But the CP leadership opposed it, and opposed it flatly, at a time when, from all evidence, the future argument of Corbalan, will lose from here to Penco, was not valid. What the CP leaders rejected, therefore, was not a possible defeat, but on the contrary, a victory, for the implementation of this procedure would have made the alliance they were seeking with the CDP more difficult. It was therefore completely accurate to say that the CP leadership although for aims relatively different from those of the opposition, was an accomplice in the policy of obstruction and blockade against the Allende government, a policy that would create the conditions for its overthrow. This fact, as well as the hidden motives of such an action, were even more obvious when one considers the point at which, finally, the CP leadership decided to accept the idea of calling a referendum. They did so in September 1973 when everyone could see that the coup d'etat was imminent and that the demand to call a referendum was being put forward precisely by the Christian Democrats. They did so on this occasion, when there were in fact the greatest chances that the government would lose and when the referendum was one of the ultimatums addressed to the executive by Frey and his group. That they did so at this precise moment is natural and consistent with their strategy, for the referendum had changed from a chance to escape the blackmail of the pro-imperialist faction of the CDP to a condition for eventual agreement with this faction, a goal sought by the leaders of the CP and of the USSR. But the sabotage against the government by those who orchestrated the policy of social imperialism in Chile was not only in their opposition to everything that would mean relying on the masses of people. This sabotage also came up, again in view of a pact with the CDP, each time that President Allende tried to take more severe measures against military men caught plotting. In August 1973, for example, barely two months after the Dancaso, the democratic and constitutionalist Chilean army gave birth to another attempted putsch, led by generals Bonilla, Nuno, Baeza, Arellano, Javier Palacios, and Torres de la Cruz. <laughs> 
What was the attitude of the CP leadership? According to Joan Garcés, quote, The secretary of the CP, Luis Corbalan, stated his disagreement when, on August 21 and 23, Allende informed him of his intention to retire. That same week, six army generals who were known to head a plot, end quote. Quote, the Socialist Party, Mapu, and the Christian Left, end quote, reports Garces, quote, wished the government to adopt offensive measures and fully assume the risk of armed confrontation. But the Communist Party's analysis of the situation and its preference were very different. Still trying to avoid civil war, the CP looked towards the Christian Democrats and sought to unite their votes in Parliament with the UP votes in order to declare a state of siege, end quote. During this period, the CDP leadership tried to use blackmail against the government by demanding, as a condition of voting in favor of the state of siege, that the government approve the CDP's constitutional reform to cancel the government nationalizations, which Allende flatly refused to do. The Minister of Justice, Sergio Insunza, a member of the CP leadership, then reduced the planned state of siege to only three months in order to reach an agreement with the CDP and asked Garces, quote, not to use his influence to convince the president to continue to demand from the CDP all the legal powers, without exception, that the Constitution grants, in order to deal with the alert that the military coup had just created, end quote. Quote, a useless preoccupation, end quote, adds Garces, for, quote, 60 hours later, the CDP said that it would refuse even three months, that would grant the government no extraordinary powers against subversion. End quote. Strangely, the commander in chief of the armed forces, General Prats, was of the same opinion as the CP leadership and maintained to President Allende that quote, we can only prepare the counter coup. End quote. To which President Allende, according to Garces, replied quote, General, everything depends on the force with which they deliver the first coup. End quote. Translator's note, the literal meaning of coup, as in coup d'etat, is a blow. End translator's note. Finally, faced with an imminent coup d'etat and the rejection by the Frey faction of the CDP, which now officially controlled the party, of any agreement with the UP, Prats deserted his post by resigning his commission as commander-in-chief of the armed forces, and putting himself into retirement, following a few provocations by people in the opposition and by military wives. He did so, according to his letter of resignation, so as, quote, not to become a factor for the disruption of institutional discipline and for disturbance of the law, nor to serve as a pretext to those who want to overthrow the constitutional government, end quote. A strange way to achieve all that. A few weeks after Prat's resignation, the coup d'etat was carried out. In the middle of 1972, after the initial calm of the first year of UP government, the efforts of the CP leadership to obtain an agreement with the CDP were intensified in the face of the growing crisis and of the opposition offensive. Within the UP, there was a dangerous, for the goals of the CP, nervous irritation with the official tactic. On May 12, in Concepcion, a militant demonstration took place which was forbidden by the communist intendant. All the local UP forces took part, except, naturally, those of the CP. The demonstration was violently repressed, and the police forces assassinated a supporter of Spartacus, youth organization of the RCP, in the street. The CP leadership tolerated verbal disagreements with its line, but not the insubordination of its allies, especially when the latter were with the masses. The next month, in June 1972, the UP held the Locurro meeting in order to debate the differences which had come up between a number of organizations in the UP and the official line imposed by the CP. At this meeting, the CP leadership, through a member of its secretariat, Orlando Millas, proposed that what had been achieved be consolidated and that the reforms not be deepened. The SP, Mapu, and the Christian left, on the other hand, wanted to continue the progress of reforms toward socialism. They believed this goal could be achieved not by organizing the struggle for power, but by carrying on with expropriations. At Locurro, however, the line of the CP leadership won out. Even President Allende, 
who was planning his trip to the USSR to desperately ask for help, which, as we have seen, would be refused him, took the side of the CP leadership. However, what the CP leaders had in the back of their minds was not only to consolidate the achievements and not continue the march forward, but to go backward in order to reach a point of agreement with the CDP. They proposed to retreat on the number of firms that would be transferred to the public sector, on the refusal to apply the policy demanded by the Yankee Organization for Economic Control of the Latin American countries, called the International Monetary Fund, on the policy of indexing wages and salaries to the exorbitant rise in the cost of living, etc. With regard to agrarian reform, they proposed to stabilize what had already been expropriated and to go no further forward. Resorting to verbal trickery to hide this proposed retreat, and at the same time showing whom he was obeying, Victor Diaz, member of the CC of the CP, stated in an interview on June 22, 1972, quote, To consolidate is to advance, and to the same extent, an agreement with the Christian Democrats, an eventuality that is becoming possible, would be a positive thing, end quote. On his part, Volodya Tietelboim, in order to impose the compromise with the CDP that the CP leaders wanted, took up the terror campaign as his own and wrote, quote, We want for this country neither the fate of invaded Vietnam, nor of Santo Domingo, nor of Guatemala. We want the problems of our nation to be resolved by the majority, knowing that this struggle cannot cross the limits beyond which it will jump the institutional rails and careen down a road of no return. We believe that people are playing with fire. The secret marriage which, in the name of the law, we maintain with violence, seems horrible to me. We are against any form of violence that could embroil the country in a fratricidal struggle. But just as it takes two to fight, it also takes two to avoid the quarrel. And on this question, we think that the responsibility does not belong only to the UP, but also to the CDP and all those who consider that just men can save the country from catastrophe. End quote. Statements like that of a, quote, profound Marxist content, end quote, which became more and more pronounced during Tietelboim's senatorial campaign, earned him the following question from a National Party leader during a televised debate. Quote, Are you a communist candidate for the Senate or for the Archbishop of Santiago? End quote. Shortly after the Locuro meeting, as an expression of the victory of the CP position, Orlando Millas was named Minister of Finance. At the same time, Luis Figueroa, president of the CUT and leader of the CP, was named Minister of Labor in order to more efficiently put the brakes on the workers' struggle. From his ministry, without consulting his allies, Milla sent to Parliament a bill in which he reduced to just over 40 the number of firms to be transferred to the public sector. At the beginning, the UP had spoken of 250 firms, then of 140, later of 90, a number that was finally reduced by Millas to about 42. In addition, he accepted for some state enterprises the CDP thesis of transforming them into workers' enterprises, owned by the workers. At the same time, he entered into relations with the International Monetary Fund, which were expressly condemned by the UP program, submitted to its demands, monetary devaluation, wage and salary freeze, restriction of credit, etc., and thus obtained a $42.5 million credit. What is more, in order to please their hypothetical interlocutors of the CDP, the CP leaders ordered violent repression against the shantytown of Lo Hermida. Following orders emanating from the offices of the Undersecretariat of the Interior, Daniel Vergara, a member of the CP, descended on this shantytown at 5 o'clock in the morning on August 4, 1972, with more than 350 policemen armed with submachine guns, as the subsequent inquiry ordered by President Allende showed. One inhabitant was killed and dozens of others wounded by bullets. One of those who led the operation was the deputy head of the civil police, Carlos Toro, a member of the CP. The CP newspapers had run the front page headline, quote, Let's calm down the leftists, end quote. Following the repression and the economic measures taken by Millas without consultation, various parties in the UP protested. After having observed, following Allende's trip to the USSR, that their bosses were turning their backs on them, the CP leaders haste to obtain an agreement with the CDP 
turned into real despair. They no longer deigned to consult their allies and staged a real coup d'etat inside the UP. Later, they would split Mapu, which had moved away from their positions following an internal congress, using elements they had infiltrated into it. At the end of January 1973, the SP stated, quote, With respect to the statement made by the Minister of the Economy, Orlando Millas, and the announcement of a bill sent to the National Congress on the delimitation of the public sector, the mixed sector, and the enterprises designated special cases, these were the workers' enterprises promised by Millas to the CDP, the political commission of the Socialist Party has resolved to state publicly that these decisions were not the subject of any consultation with our party and that, furthermore, we are not in agreement with their content. End quote. The Christian left, for its part, criticized the government for having taken up, despite the difference of opinion existing on this question within the UP, quote, the futile discussions with the CDP, end quote, and for having announced, quote, the basis of a new economic policy, the UP leaders only being informed of such a policy several days later. Unquote. However, the content of the criticism by some parties in the UP of the policy of the CP leaders was not aimed at the real motives of this policy, nor did it offer a correct solution. Often, influenced by Trotskyist ideas, they maintained that the errors of the CP policy grew out of its refusal to advance immediately towards socialism which was obvious, but not only immediately, and that, for this reason, the CEP leaders wanted an alliance with sections of the non-monopoly bourgeoisie and with the middle sections to set them against the monopoly bourgeoisie, imperialism, and the landlords, thus conceiving the revolution in stages. These ideas, entirely correct in the case of Chile, but correct as a strategy for a united front led by the proletariat, had, however, nothing to do with the strategy of the CP leading group. The latter did not seek an alliance with certain non-monopoly sections of the bourgeoisie and with the middle sections, which would have been correct, to fight and annihilate the main enemies mentioned above. On the contrary, it tried to put pressure on the monopolist sections of the bourgeoisie, on the imperialist firms, and on the landlords, by threatening them with isolation, to thus obtain an alliance with these same dominant sections at the expense of the interests of the workers and of the middle sections. To realize this, one has only to consider the policy proposed by Midias. The reduction in the number of monopoly enterprises slated for transfer to the public sector was a measure to benefit not the middle sections, but the big bourgeoisie. The limits on the expropriation of big land estates and the opposition to their reserves being reduced from a base of 80 irrigated hectares to 40 hectares were not to favor the middle peasants, but the big landlords. The guarantees given to imperialism for the creation of joint ventures with the state were in favor of the U.S. monopolies. The implementation of the policy of the International Monetary Fund, directly opposed to the middle bourgeoisie and the workers, was favorable to the big imperialist interests. Lastly, the holding back and the repression of any mass mobilization and the strict adherence to the institutions and laws of the bourgeois state favored only the imperialist circles of the big bourgeoisie and the landlords, who controlled state power. Although the CP leaders wanted to take the place of these dominant sections as a bureaucratic bourgeoisie, they were incapable of doing so under the conditions in Chile. And hence, in accordance with the strategy of social imperialism, what they wanted was an alliance with these dominant sections, or part of them, in order to develop state capitalism. This policy has nothing to do with the formation of an anti-imperialist, anti-monopolist, and anti-landlord national united front led by the proletariat to isolate and annihilate these enemies and for the people to win power. The teachings of Lenin on phony communism must not be forgotten. Quote, the opportunists are bourgeois enemies of the proletarian revolution, who in peaceful times carry on their bourgeois work in secret, concealing themselves within the workers' parties, while in times of crisis, they immediately proved to be open allies of the entire united bourgeoisie, from the conservative to the most radical and democratic part of the latter, from the free thinkers to the religious and clerical sections. Anyone who has failed to understand this truth after the events we have gone through is hopelessly deceiving both himself and the workers." End quote. It was precisely the secret work done by, quote, concealing themselves within the workers' parties, end quote, 
that made the honest sections of the traditional Chilean left forget the true character of those who falsify Marxism, first to become allies of all the exploiters, and later exploiters themselves. The latter tendency has notably grown in our era, when phony communists have taken power and established state capitalism in a number of countries. The policy of Orlando Millas, which we have described, begun in the middle of 1972, carried on in 1973, although, instead of reaching an agreement with them, the CDP launched an open offensive in the employer strike of October 1972, with the aim of overthrowing the government. This strike offered the CP leadership favorable conditions for obtaining the surrender of the government and the agreement with the CDP that it coveted. However, its plans ran into an obstacle. The strike gave rise to an intense militancy and mobilization of the people, and was defeated by the firm attitude of the working class in particular. However, at a time when it was fully possible and necessary to launch a counteroffensive to smash the retreating Putsch's circles, the CEP leaders managed to transform the people's victory into a defeat for the government. A cabinet was appointed including the armed forces, who were credited with the solution of the already disintegrating strike. The people were demobilized by resorting to the March 1973 elections as a means of smoothing over the conflicts with the opposition, and shameful concessions were made with the defeated, with the organizers of the strike. Economic guarantees were given so as to keep the paper monopoly in the private sector, one of the main watchwords of the opposition. Radio Agriculture of Los Angeles and the newspaper El Sur of Concepcion, which were being run by the government because they had incited subversion, were given back. The power of the JAPs and those which the industrial cordons had won in the struggle against the strike were cancelled. The trial of the strike leaders was cancelled, and a guarantee was given that there would be no reprisals against the participants. Guarantees were given that transport would remain in the private sector. A commitment was made to give back the commercial establishments and industrial enterprises that had been occupied by the workers after being paralyzed, or to avoid their being paralyzed. The wholesale trading company, Codina, really a center used by the opposition to create shortages in black market, was taken off the list of firms to be expropriated, and so on. In addition to the measures which were made public, there were secret agreements by Mijas with the CDP which, as we have seen, were not even known to the parties of the UP. What finally happened after this policy of betrayal of the people's interests, with a view to a pact with the CDP? The CP leadership itself clearly showed what happened in a document that appeared in March 1976, in which it stated, quote, In June 1972, when Senator Renan Fuentealba was president of the CDP, that party and the UP were on the verge of signing a set of agreements that were to be implemented into law. The possibility presented itself of putting into practice both the UP program and the program supported by Radomiro Tomic during the presidential campaign. Such convergences enraged the fascists who are today temporarily in power. At the very moment when this patriotic agreement was going to be signed, Frey himself used every means to demand the annulment of this act. That the pact existed is absolutely certain, but the conditions under which the CP leaders maintain it would have been signed are absolutely false, for, as we have seen, the agreement was not based on the UP program, nor on the most advanced of the reforms in the Tomic program, but on shameful concessions to the imperialist and reactionary interests that Frey supported. It was with him that the CP leaders sought agreement, using the sections of the CDP closest to the UP as instruments to this end. The proof of this is that Frey was able to impose his annulment without the left wing of the CDP struggling to demand the implementation of these reforms. The intuition of broad middle strata and of the workers in the CDP, who were aware of the oppressive exploiting systems which exist in the USSR and its Warsaw Pact allies, and who confused these systems with socialism and communism, allowed, and today still allow, Frey and his team to oppose an alliance with the coalition in which the pro-Soviet CP leadership would play a dominant role. Naturally, Frey used this confusion among the CDP rank and file and did not let his real motives show through. To serve the policy of U.S. imperialism and the internal reactionary forces. The reason why we have included the efforts of the CP leaders to obtain an alliance with the CDP at all costs in this chapter where we are analyzing the contention of the superpowers in Chile, 
is that their policy is directly imposed as a strategy by the Soviet rulers. Gorbalan defines himself and his party as pro-Soviet, but the truth is that they are much more than that. A pro is one who spontaneously admires an institution or a person, a football team or a performer, but the relations of Korbalan and other CP leaders with the Soviet bureaucrats are not relations of mere admiration, but of dependence and subordination. Furthermore, this leading group is one of the most servile and unquestioning toward the Soviet leaders in the entire world. We have already pointed out in the first part of this book how the Chilean CP, which had gone about 11 years without holding a congress, held one a few months after the 20th Congress of the CPSU for the sole purpose of transposing the line approved in the USSR to Chile. There were cases in which the list of members of the Central Committee of the CP was learned by listening to Radio Moscow before they were elected in a congress taking place in Chile. In the framework of the polemic by the Marxist-Leninists against modern revisionism, not only did they align themselves without any debate with the positions of the Soviet leadership, but they forced all their leaders and important trade union cadres to write articles against the communist parties of Albania and China. During the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia, they were the first party in the world to give their public approval to this invasion. Furthermore, they publicly attacked the Cuban leaders when, in the beginning, the latter sometimes demonstrated their independence from the Soviets. The line of alliance with the CDP, which they followed in a blindly obsessed manner, was only an application of the orders of the Soviet leaders. It was the Soviet line for Chile, and on some points for Latin America, faithfully carried out by their agents in our country. In this sense, the leaders of the Chilean CP were the precursors, unfortunate precursors to be sure, of the historic compromise of Berlinguer in Italy, and of the line which Marche in France and Carrillo in Spain stubbornly implement, despite the traits of independence which they try to show towards the USSR. The events in Chile explain, in some way, a fact that surprises many people in Europe, and which was noted, for example, by Jean-Pierre Vigier, an ex-member of the CC of the French CP, writing in Le Monde of July 22, 1976, quote, Things have reached a point where we are witnessing the amazing spectacle of a big workers' party, the Italian CP, making desperate efforts not to come to power. End quote. If one thinks about this, it is the same logic that inspired the Chilean CP, and it is normal that this should be the case, because the two obey the same leading center. Faithfulness to this foreign line also explains the form in which the situation in Chile unfolded following the launching of the coup d'etat. After the failure of the pact with Fuente Alba, after the resignation of Prats, their lever in the army, after the official takeover of the CDP by the Frey faction, and faced with evidence that a coup d'etat was inevitable, the efforts of the CP leaders were aimed at preventing any kind of resistance to the coup d'etat. Politically, they did this by giving ever more forcefully the suicidal and demobilizing slogan, No to Civil War. This slogan obviously did absolutely nothing to hold back the military putschists, who obeyed the slogans of circles very different from the CP, but did hold back the popular strata that wanted to resist the coup, as well as sections of the armed forces that were potentially faithful to the government. And this was no mere slogan. For months after the coup d'etat, one could meet CP militants in exile who, in their naivete, praised the foresight of their leaders who, weeks before the coup d'etat, had made them turn in the few guns that they had stocked in some factories. For example, the leaders of the coal miners' union, members of the CP who headed a powerful proletarian organization, and who, because of their work, had access to lots of dynamite, waited in vain in their trade union offices for instructions from their leaders, who undoubtedly were already holed up in some embassy, while the military hesitated to go into these mines, expecting stiff resistance. Finally, the military found them in these offices and shot them on the spot. Lastly, the main leader of the CUT, Jorge Goloy, a leading member of the CP, was presented by the military junta on the television networks during the days when the coup d'etat was being executed to make an appeal to cease all resistance and collaborate. Such treason cannot be justified under the pretext of any pressure, no matter what, for those who believe they are revolutionaries, 
What was the cause of the shameful attitude of the leaders of the CP of facilitating the coup d'etat by destroying and discouraging any possibility of resistance? It was that they believed that a few months after the overthrow of the Allende government, the army would give the presidential mandate back to Frey, who had even got himself elected president of the Senate in order to claim a legal right of succession recognized by the Constitution, for he thought he could receive the presidential mandate that way. In this manner, after the failure of their strategy to prevent a coup d'etat through an alliance with the CDP under the Allende government, the CP leaders prepared to carry on their pressure for such an alliance from exile by offering themselves as collaborators of Frey and his team. To achieve this, they had to demonstrate their ability to hold back all resistance to the coup d'etat, and even more so, all threat of civil war based on a potential split in the armed forces. What neither they nor Frey counted on was that the military putschists wanted to stay in power. In spite of everything, they have not abandoned their strategy and persist in it, although in much more difficult conditions, despite rejection by the Frey wing, which is not unaware that such an alliance is unacceptable to the US and that the possibility of such an alliance in the past was one of the reasons for the coup d'etat.